Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you could be with us today here at Trinity. If you have your bulletin with you, I invite you to take that out and look at it uh, with me for just a moment. There's a registration form in there. You can tear that out, fill it out, put it in the offering plate later in the service. That would be great. We do have Wednesday night supper this week, so if you want to make reservations for that, you can do that as well. I uh, have several announcements. One, uh, today or tonight, we will have no activities after 6 o'clock. Um, there's a Dickens meeting at 4.30, and we have a praise team at 4.30. I think maybe another activity going on with Glenn, but at 6 o'clock, we will be done. With incoming bad weather, we weren't sure, you know, how things were going to be. So we will reschedule the, the worship in action night tonight for another night. So just be aware of that this evening. K groups, the lists are out. Uh, it's on a table in the gathering area, so you can take a look at that today after the service if you would like. And then Wednesday night, like I said, we have uh, supper, regular activities start back. Um, at 6 o'clock, though, there's also Madison Farmers Market presentation. Um, they are interested in using the south part of our property, and uh, so they're going to present that uh, proposal this Wednesday night. The following Wednesday night, January the 15th, there will be a special called church conference to consider that partnership with the farmer's market. There will also be a nominating committee um, update that night, uh, and that will be on the 15th. So just keep those two Wednesday nights in mind, the next two Wednesday nights. We have something uh, a little special going on. And then finally, Beth Moore Bible Study begins January the 27th. That's in a few weeks, but the books are available now. Glenn has those in his office, so if you want to see him after uh, this service, he'll be glad to get that to you. Now I invite you to please stand for our passing of the peace. I invite you now to please join me in the call to worship that you will find uh, printed in your bulletin. Come, all that are faithful and all that seek faith. It is the season to sing and rejoice. The symbol of new hope and spirit shines, the spirit of peace. And we will follow and find that peace. We now have a promise fulfilled by God. Amen. Please bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, having the celebration of the birth of your Son and the turning of the new year freshly behind us, we look ahead to a new beginning. We ask of you to be the object of our affection this year. Help us to experience love of you, for you, in you, and through you like never before. Remind us of how beautiful your love is and how exceptional life can be when we pursue you. Reward us with your presence, even in the simplest of efforts, whether it be reading our Bibles with a new desire or setting aside a special time each day to be with you or making prayer time a priority. Remind us that it is in this time spent with you pursuing a closer relationship, that we find our joy 
and deepest fulfillment. Thank you that Jesus himself set this example and that he is always with us and will never leave us. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of Christmas Tide, hymn number 95. Go tell it on the mountain. Please stand as we sing together. Be seated. Good morning. For our be still and know moment during our service, I'd like you to consider our focus passage for today. We'll be hearing it all read in a few moments, but there's one particular verse in John's Gospel, chapter 1, in that prologue as he introduces this good news book. He shares with us the idea that the Word of God became flesh. And I wanted to read just the first part of that uh, verse in verse 14 for us today that we'll be focusing on later on in the sermon and ask you just to reflect on that this moment uh, as we share this time of be still and know and know what it means to have the presence of the reality of the Word become flesh in your life and in the life of our world. This is what it says. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. Let us pray. Our Lord, we thank you for these moments in our worship service when we can stop and pause and be still and know that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of praise, hymn number 100. Angels we have heard on high, please stand as we sing together. Buildings' walls are sagging, the wall plaster is crumbling, and anti gypsy graffiti reappears as quickly as it is erased. But inside the rusty doors of the Koptova Roma Gypsy School in Kloshitsa, Slovakia, young gypsy students are doing an extraordinary thing preparing for college. 
Roma children in Slovakia are rarely allowed to attend school past the sixth grade, but a few brave teachers are willing to step outside racial boundaries to offer these students a life-changing education. CBF field personnel John and Tanya Parks live in Kloshitsa and serve as English tutors in the school. Through them, God is opening doors to share the good news with young people who are hungry for love and acceptance. Please join me for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Still, still, still to sleep is now his will. On Mary's breast he rests in slumber while we pray. morning. I wanted to wish you all a very happy new year. I hope it's gotten off to a great start for you. And I also want to let you know that uh, Taylor, our minister of music, is going to celebrate his one year anniversary with us on Tuesday. It's hard to believe one year has gone by. And I told him the early service, in honor of that, we're going to let all the schools start a couple hours early this week so we can <laughs> recognize that. Well, we're real proud of Taylor and appreciate that was a beautiful song that you sang for us this morning. Uh, in preparation for next week's sermon, next week we're going to be talking about some goals for our year as a church, and this is something that I've done for many years. I think Ronnie did it as well, called a State of the Church uh, message, and I'll usually do that around the anniversary of when I came uh, to Trinity, so I'll do that next week and lay out some stuff for us to consider for this year. But in preparation for that, what I'd like for you to do is to do your own prayerful thoughts about what your goals are for your year. What is God laying on your heart for you for your life, for your life involvement in this church, and for your spiritual life, uh, maybe for your family. What is God calling you to do? And I hope that you'll do that. And I'm anxious to hear about some of the things maybe God is doing in your life. So I hope that you'll share that with your pastor and with the staff, uh, Sunday school classes, friends, and whatever. Uh, for today, I want us to think about this wonderful passage John shares for us. It's a very unique way of thinking about Christmas, and we're still on the very end of Christmas time. John tells us this prologue, this beginning to his wonderful gospel, 
Uh, and we might expect, because his gospel is so different from the other three, he tells the Christmas story in a very different way. There's no baby in the manger. There's this cosmic experience of the universe and the, something we know is the logos of the Word, the Word of God becoming flesh, the brave essence or presence of God becoming flesh, and that being the one we lift up as our Savior, Jesus. And when I was growing up, uh, my family liked to camp. I remember the very first camper that my family had, my daddy made. He built a camper. It was made all out of wood, painted it completely red. And we would head off to the mountains or wherever. And throughout growing up those years, my family always camped. And when my mom remarried, my stepfather bought us a camper. And we thought we really had gone way up. It was one of those that was sat on stilts out in the backyard. And we'd drive his old Ford truck up under it, and he and I would bolt it down. And then we'd all load up, and we'd head to the beach, and we'd camp there, or we'd head out to the lake, and we'd go camping. A lot of times we had tents, but when we had that camper, I thought, wow, I really got it made. But one thing I noticed is when we went camping as a family, uh, things completely changed. The environment that you're in there was very different from where you were. So when we went, and oftentimes we'd go to the lake at Chestnut's Fish Camp at Weiss Lake over in East Alabama. And when we'd go over there, that whole experience was very different from what I was used to. We would get there and time was different. We didn't, nobody had to get up and go to work. There was no school. I could stay up all night if I wanted to, fishing for catfish off the pier with that light at the end of that pier. And I loved to do that. There was a, a platform in the swimming area where we could swim out to and we could dive off of it, jump off of it. It was a lot of fun. I used to love when I was a kid to pretend like I was a ship and I would just sort of come into shore and just sort of on my belly and just float right into shore. And I thought about telling y'all that, and I thought, well, you know, after Christmas, after all I've eaten, if I did that this summer, they'll tow me back out to the ocean. <laughs> Or something. I don't know about you, but, but I enjoyed Christmas time and all the food we had. Uh, but that tradition of camping was just instilled with me when I was really young. And I've always loved going out into the woods and the mountains, campgrounds or whatever. I always enjoyed that experience. And the people that you meet at campgrounds. It's amazing the relationships that you can build with people in campgrounds. So I've done that with my family. And we, from the very beginning of having these kids, we've gone camping. And most of the time, when we go, we go up to the Great Smoky Mountains. And I've told you a little bit about that before. We now have a pop-up camper, so it's, it's really amazing uh, that we've moved up to that level. It's sort of like a glorified tent, but imagine all six of us in a pop-up camper. It's really a sight to see. But we started out with a tent. And the first time that we ever went to the Smoky Mountains, I bought this new tent, and we really had no idea what we were getting into. The Smoky Mountains is a unique environment, as you know, which means it rains every day in the Smokies. So we got there and I said, well, no problem. We've got this uh, rain fly on top of the, uh, of the tent. Well, we noticed everybody else in the campground had big tarps all over their tents. So we learned very quickly that a rain fly will not do it in the Smokies because the rain's going to come down at such a rate that everybody in the tent's going to get really wet. We learned that lesson personally uh, as a family. So we learned to, to get better at camping as we went along. We learned to bring tarps with us, a lot more ropes. We learned how to cook over the fire better. We learned a lot as we went through. Uh, we often looked like the Beverly Hillbillies on our way. We had an old red Suburban with all four of the boys. We had stuff strapped on top and on the back. And I remember one place we stopped on the way to the mountains with our family. We stopped to get some supplies or whatever, and we looked pretty rough on the way up there. It's <laughs> not even on the way back. On the way up there, and somebody thought I was a Church of God preacher and Mary homeschooled these poor barefoot kids that we had. <laughs> I don't know. In the campground we stay at is Elkmont. It's most of the most of the places the time we go, we stay at Elkmont, which is part of the national park itself. And that means there's no electricity there. There is a, a I want to say a bathhouse, there's a restroom facility, no baths. So we don't take a bath when we're there unless it's really warm and we get in the water and we allow nature to wash over us. But sometimes we'll want to go in and eat in Gatlinburg or something. And so Mary will insist that we'll stop by the community center, we get our showers and we have a sit down meal. Occasionally, though, we skip that part, and we always think, and I don't know how you are on vacation, we're not going to see these people again. So we smell like smoke and whatever and going camping. I also have a lot of images of us camping when we set up. Almost invariably, it's going to rain when we start to set up, and it'll rain when we have to take it down. And so I have these images of Mary on several occasions when I'm trying, we're setting up, and she's got her hands on her hips, shaking her head, and she's saying something. I can't exactly make out what she's saying. <laughs> on those things. I can't make out what she's saying right now either. That <laughs> <way>. <laughs> but, 
But I think all of you know about those experiences, don't you? But one thing I've learned about camping is when it's time to, to leave, you have to pack everything up and you go back to your routine and camping trip is over. And that reminded me a lot of Christmas. We've been through Advent and Christmas and a lot of us have done a whole lot to decorate for Christmas. Maybe your house, you've brought presents, you've wrapped, you have a tree, you have all those kinds of things. And maybe you've already packed all that stuff up or you're planning to do that. And sometime before Easter, you'll have it down. But that stuff's going to be happening. All of Christmas stuff will go back in the boxes and you'll put it back in, you know, in the garage or in the attic or something like that. But I want you to remember that just because we pack up Christmas and put it back in the box doesn't mean that Jesus leaves. We celebrated the reality of the Word of God becoming flesh. Jesus being born, God entering into this world in a very unique way. And just because our celebrations end and we move on to other stuff, like the camping trip's over, doesn't mean that Jesus left. Jesus has decided to stay and will always be part of that. And so as John is telling us his version of the Christmas story, in the prologue, in the beginning of his wonderful good news book, the Gospel of John, he talks about how God is a cosmic God, a God of the universe. And that there's no dark places anywhere in the universe where the light of God can't shine. There's no place in your soul or your heart or your life that's so dark or so hidden away or so hurtful or even shameful that God can't touch it and help it and shine His light there. There's no dark corner. And what he says to us is that this cosmic God that's over everything in the universe has become very specifically known to us as the Word of God become flesh in the reality of a baby grown to be a man we know as Jesus of Nazareth. And John says it this way. He says, The Word became flesh and lived among us. A better translation might be, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived with us, among us. And an even better translation, which is literally the way it says, is that God became, the Word became flesh and God pitched His tent with us. I was shocked when I first heard that in seminary. That was the literal translation of what this meant. God had decided at one point in human history to pitch His tent among us, to live among us and be a part of us. And that really struck a chord with me because I like camping, as you know. And it really stuck a chord, I think, with the people of the Bible and all the folks back in the heritage of those days who were thinking about the glory of God and where you would go to find the glory of God. Where would you go to find the presence of God in the world? Well, a lot of them in, in the New Testament days would say, we know it's at the temple. It's at this place in the temple where you can go and the glory of God resides in that, in that house, if you will, in Jerusalem. That's where you could go to meet with God if you wanted to. And others would say in our spiritual memory, we go back even further and we remember in the days of Moses before we had a building where you could go meet God, that there was a tabernacle that traveled around with us as we wandered around in the wilderness. They called it a tent. <laughs> they called it the tent of meeting. It was where you would go to that tent and the glory of God would reside in that tent and you could meet God at that tent get instructions, challenge, directions, whatever, but the presence of God was at that tent, and that's where you could go to meet God. In John's Gospel, and in fact, all the Gospels, our faith tells us that that glory of God that resided in that temple and that tent now resides most fully in the very reality of the Word become flesh in Jesus. If you want to meet and experience the glory of God, you go to Jesus because it's all embodied in who Jesus is for us. God has decided to pitch God's tent in our living, in our human experience, in our world, in fact, in our lives. It's all in the body and the blood and in the life of our Lord Jesus. God became flesh. We call it the incarnation. We also think about it as Emmanuel. It means God has decided to be in the flesh, be in our presence, be real with us, be with us in this world. God has decided to pitch His tent in our living. This is a poem I found over the holidays that I thought was pretty good that spoke to me about what it meant to have God living among us. It's called, When Mary's Baby Walked This Earth. This is what it says. When Mary's baby walked this earth, 
People came from miles around to sit at His feet and hear the wisdom that could only come from God. They brought the sick, the lame, and those who were troubled in their minds. The winds and the seas had to obey Him because He was Emmanuel, God with us. Formidable demons trembled and ran away screaming when Mary's baby walked upon this earth. It's a strong reality and a statement of the fact that when the Word of God became flesh, it was God pitching His tent into our experience. Not just in the world, but in your experience too. In your life, in your living, in the things that you and I go through as men and women in this world. Now I know we're all standing here in 2014. It sounds almost like a sci-fi number to me. The older I get, those numbers just seem so strange to me. 2014. As we stand now, we're beginning a new year. And when people think about a new year, I think we always think about what will we do to begin. Maybe it's a restart for a lot of us. I've always liked starting the first service of the new year at church with the Lord's Supper. It's a time for us to share together something very unique that Jesus left us so that we could remember His bodily presence with us, His love and His devotion to us. Some people, when they come to churches to whatever church, they think of this as the Eucharist. And in some faith traditions, some Christian churches, that's what they call it. It's a service of the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word that means thanksgiving. So they think about this as a thanksgiving meal. And today you might want to think about it that way too. It's a Eucharist or a thanksgiving meal for you. It's a way for you to accept with gratitude the goodness of God, whatever God has done and is doing in your life, maybe simply for your salvation. It is the thankfulness of the blessings of this past year and the anticipation of the new year. Some people think about this and they call it the communion, maybe the Holy Communion. In some faith traditions, the whole service is related around communion. And it involves all of these things, including taking the elements of the bread and the juice. Communion is simply a word that means common life. So you might want to think about that today as you're taking this bread and this juice into your body. It is a way for you to share a common life. God pitched His tent in this world to live incarnate in the flesh just as you and I do. Maybe it's a way for you to remember that your experiences as a human being is something that God understands in a very common life way. Jesus understands you and me. But it's also a way we share it together. We pass it down the roads to our friends and our family and our neighbors who sit beside us and worship is a way to us to share a common meal because we are all bounded together. There are a lot of differences among Christians, a lot of different political persuasions and preferences and things that you do or don't do with your life, things you think are right or think are wrong, but we all have a common table. All Christians have this common table, this common life. When it comes down to it, we all take the bread. We all take the juice. It is one of the things that binds us together out of the diversity and uniqueness of all each of us is. From this church, for all churches, it, we all have a common table. And anybody who belongs to the Lord is welcome at this table to take it. In Baptist churches, when I grew up at least, we simply called it the Lord's Supper. The Baptists were never very fancy. So they took the Lord's Supper as sort of the main way they thought about this meal. And what Baptists were doing when they did that was partially throwing off the trappings of other churches where they had come from because they wanted to be very free and very just, you know, do their own thing. Each local church was autonomous. And when they said the Lord's Supper, they were talking about their idea of what was most important for them in worship. And that was the very fact that Jesus had died on the cross for their sins. So you might want to think about it this way as the Lord's Supper. And Baptist said, this bread and this juice, these things are symbols. They represent the body of Jesus hanging on the cross for all of us sinners. And this juice represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed to forgive all of us for every sin that we have ever committed, even the sins we've not committed because there were things we should have done that we did not do. There's no dark place in your soul where the blood of Christ cannot reach it and you can be redeemed from it and be forgiven. And so this supper became, for Baptists at least, 
a focus on the cross of Jesus. But whatever it is to you, this table is spread wide open for you, and you are invited to it. It is also very holy. And any time we partake of the Lord's Supper, the communion, the Eucharist, it is a holy moment, a serious and reverent moment in our congregation. I think it's a great way to begin a new year as we go forward together as a congregation of God's people. Maybe you've thought about your new year, 2014. Maybe you've thought about the things you'll be facing this year. What are your goals for 2014, for your life and for your family? What are the things you're dreaming about will happen during this year? What are you excited about? What are you dreading? What are you going to be facing that's coming up? What are your resolutions? Have you made those yet? What changes are coming for you? I'll turn 50 this year on a Sunday morning. I think Mary and the boys have black all picked out for that day. It'll be amazing. Things will be changing for all of us. What's coming for you? Maybe you might have considered where you're going to pitch your tent this year. You might actually go camping in the Smokies. We'll wave at you. We'll share some trout over the fire. But I'm talking more about how God pitched His tent of His life in our world. And since we're supposed to imitate God, maybe God is asking us to pitch our tent alongside people in this world. And I wonder where that place will be for you this year. Where will it be that God will ask you to pitch your tent to help out, to make a difference, to represent Jesus? Because we are that, aren't we? We're the body of Christ today. The people who believe in Jesus, who've accepted the reception of His blood from the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and are saved, we are Christians. We are to represent Jesus in this world. We are to be His body, His hands and His feet wherever we go. Where do you think it is that God is asking you to pitch your tent this year? There was a book some years ago called An Altar in the World. And part of what that was about was about a lady talking about how she could find places to worship God all over the place, not just in church, maybe in the mountains, maybe at the beach, somewhere in the world. She found places where she could put an altar because she could have experiences with God in those places. I wonder if we could also write a book called Pitching Our Tents in the World because there are all those other places too where you and I can pitch our tent, come alongside somebody or some cause that means a lot to us, something we've been called to do, something that gives us deep joy to do, something where we feel like God is using us to be God's people, to be in that place and to do those things. So where will you pitch your tent this year? Some of you were wired, created by God, so that when you do certain things, they bring you a lot of energy, a lot of joy to do them. Some of you are wired by God where you, you love working with kids. And when you're working with children, you can see their smiles just go all the way over your face and through your mouth and to your stomach and to your heart and to your soul. It fills you up and it builds you up. Maybe that's where you need to pitch your tent this year. Some of you are good at sitting with older adults. You love just sitting and talking and holding hands and sharing memories and being present with those who oftentimes don't have as many visitors as, as they used to when they were younger. Some of you like to teach. You have the gift and the ability to share your wisdom, at least to facilitate good discussion. Some of you have the gift of leadership. Some of you don't want to be in front of anybody at all, but you like to get your hands dirty. You want to do something with your hands where you can help somebody out and feel like because you saw it and touched it, you helped make a difference with it. Your church has a place for you to pitch your tent. There's somehow in the ministry of this congregation, that's part of what church is about, is facilitating Christians wanting to pitch their tent, wanting to be the body of Christ, wanting to represent Jesus, wanting to have the fulfillment of what God created them to be, have that lived out through the life of their congregation and extend that into the kingdom of God. So where will you pitch your tent this year? In our church and in this world. And what are you going to be facing? What's coming up for you in your life this year? You know, some of the best memories I have are memories of pitching a tent. When I was going camping, for sure, but also pitching my tent like Jesus did it, alongside people. 
I have great memories of pitching my tent alongside people where I wanted to dwell for a while, where I wanted to serve and love and be loved by them and maybe make a difference. What about you? What about your memories? I bet you have good memories of pitching your tent somewhere along somebody and it still makes you feel glad and puts a smile on your face. So what is it for you? And what does this year have in store for you? What is this year going to bring for you? I can tell you this, whatever it is, good or bad, according to our judgments, whatever this year brings to you, you need to remember that God has already pitched His tent in your life. You won't face it alone. That's what the God word become flesh incarnate means. That's what Emmanuel means. God has decided to stick with us, pitch His tent in our lives, in our church, in our community, and in our world. Not to leave like vacation and it's over, but to always be present in our lives. What are you going to face this year? What are you going to attempt this year? What's exciting you about this year? What's scaring you about this year? Whatever this year brings to you, don't forget that you will not face it alone. God will be with you. That's God with us. Emmanuel. God pinched His tent with us. God with us. God with you. God with me. God with our families. Our lonely. Our sick. God with our church. God with our community. God with our world. Emmanuel. God with us. Today, we come together to share around this table with this bread and this juice. They are symbols of the body and the blood and the love and the presence, the eternal presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this morning, I invite you to come to it, to accept it as symbols that represent God with us. Emmanuel. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church. And I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.